Oscar Wilde is one of the most quoted writers of all time. But I want to start this out by talking about a quote from The Picture of Dorian Gray that is not among the most quoted of all quotes from Oscar Wilde. Consider this line. It is only shallow people who do not judge by appearances. It is only shallow people who do not judge by appearances. Now, the subject of the picture of Dorian Gray is physical beauty, which is to say the physical beauty of a person, which is something that we, in today's day and age, admiring a person's physical beauty is no longer associated with intellect and connoisseurship. By contrast, we are considered deep if we might credibly say we appreciate the beauty of the visual arts, right? Everybody can marvel at the beauty of a setting sun. But if you were to say in broad sweeping terms, the thing I appreciate most is the way beautiful people look. That's unacceptable today. Oscar Wilde disagrees. The subject matter of the picture of Dorian Gray is the archaic study of beauty. What is its nature? It is a thing that exists only as a subjective opinion about an existing object. All propositions touching upon it are therefore simultaneously true and false, real and imagined, physical and abstract. If it even exists scientifically, then beauty is no different than the theory of gravity or the proverb of a dead poet. It would extract from us this dreadful admission. I cannot conceive why this is so. So just to remind of what the plot is, um, Dorian Gray, the character, um, is a youth of great beauty who is painted by Basil Hallward. The painter, in turn, introduces Dorian uh, to Lord Henry, and the two of them form a kind of Socratic bond, very similar kind of to Socrates and Alcibiades, the, the, in an almost Greek sense of, of the mentor and the youth. Being persuaded by Lord Henry that beauty and youth are the only things worth having and that beauty is destined to fade, Dorian Gray wishes that it would be the painting that it would, would absorb the marks of age and not him. And that is what happens supernaturally. The painting ages, Dorian Gray does not. And in addition to this, the painting ultimately shows all the marks of Dorian Gray's sins. Whenever he does something iniquitous, the painting of him becomes a little uglier for it. So now let's get back to the full context of that quote from the beginning. The quote is um, spoken dialogue from Lord Henry. So here it is. Beauty is a form of genius. It's higher indeed than genius as it needs no explanation. People say sometimes that beauty is only superficial that may be so, but at least it is not so superficial as thought is. To me, beauty is the wonder of wonders. It is only shallow people who do not judge by appearances. The true mystery of the world is the visible, not the invisible. So what, is, what does he mean? Well, I think the easy, uh, the easy quick answer is, is that if the impact of beauty must happen upon the mind then it stands to reason that the more powerful the mind, the greater the impact that beauty will have. And so then it follows that the shallower and dumber the mind, the less of an impact it will have. And what he's saying about the visible versus the invisible is a very significant and deep thing to say. And he's quite right. It's harder mentally. It is harder intellectually to work with the real. Something about Oscar Wilde's word choice. He says thought. He doesn't say something more uh, broad like study. I don't. It's, I wouldn't. I would say that when Oscar Wilde says thought, he does not incorporate science into that. I think he means quite literally thought. 
sim- simply um, propounding. And to, and to back myself up on this later on, much later on in the book, uh, this is Dorian Gray's thought process. He felt keenly conscious of how barren all intellectual speculation is when separated from action and experiment. He knew that the senses, no less than the soul, have their spiritual mysteries to reveal. Intellectual speculation, that I think is the thought, speculative, abstract, crap. So in other words, the human appearance is a species within the genus of the natural, visible world. And people who have a propensity for intellect will seek to engage the natural, physical world, thinking about it quantitatively, qualitatively, take its measure, observe it, and and consider it out of a sort of scientific and intellectual curiosity. How could a person who thinks like that not be struck in awe by the nature's capacity to create life with such geometric, symmetrical, and vibrant precision that it, in which it creates a, a handful of people? Which brings us back to the question of what type of thought Oscar Wilde means when he's talking about superficiality. He had said in that, in that original quote that, yeah, beauty is superficial, but not nearly as superficial as thought is. I think the type of thought he really means, he means abstract thought, but I think particularly he means morality. Oscar Wilde hates social convention and he hates morality and indeed, I think he almost would, would prefer to deny its existence than to favor those who think in moral terms. In fact, here he defines morality. <clears throat> this is for the text. Modern morality consists in accepting the standard of one's age. That's what he, how Oscar Wilde defines morality. And if that is the way that he defines morality, it follows logically, therefore, that he considers morality to be shifting. Morality is simply what the majority of people think is correct and good. Those are the shallow people, moral people. And I think what Oscar Wilde would say is that moral people have a tendency to wear those morals and express those morals And since they give their morals such expression, why could it not be called a superficial thing, even though it doesn't literally have a surface the way that beauty does, he could still place it under the umbrella of superficiality. So if the distinction between the intellectual and the shallow is that the intellectual considers objects at rest or in motion, arrested by beauty and piqued by the natural sciences, while the shallow person will operate in a kind of abstract sociality despising of real things, then Oscar Wilde has this observation in common with Moliere. And by the way, remember Moliere's, now we're going to, remember I said earlier, most, most of the great minds before 1900 would agree with Oscar Wilde. Remember Moliere's definition of a precious, they're so dainty, that they can't stand anything common or real, and they can't call anything by its right name. That was Moliere's definition of a pretentious woman. They're so dainty that they can't stand anything real. Oscar Wilde is also not the first person to associate an appreciation of beauty with the power of your intellect. Um, in, In a very fundamental sense, in Paradise Lost, Book 9, eating from the fruit of the tree of knowledge makes Adam capable of appreciating Eve's beauty. The moment he eats from it, he looks at her. And there are these great lines. He says, Eve, I see thou art exact of taste and elegant of sapience. No small part. Sapience is the direct, is, is what correlates with his ability to appreciate her beauty. Vondel, in his play, Lucifer, does the same thing. Wonderful. The body's shapely mold attests the maker's art, that in the face the mirror of the mind doth best appear. But wonderful, upon the face is stamped the image of the soul. All beauty here concenters, while a god looks through the eyes. 
then he then he goes on to say the love of beauty fashioned in the brain deeply impressed by the senses keen this makes their union strong he's referring to the marital union of adam and eve prior to the fall according to the writer andre chastel for raphael beauty is the promise of happiness for Leonardo, it is the solicitation of a profound mystery, and that's going to turn out to be close to what Winkelmann says in a second. But for Michelangelo, it's a source of torment and moral distress. Now I'm quoting from Gilles Nere's book on Michelangelo, which, by the way, can be bought very cheaply, I think, on Amazon and is worth it. Great book. So this is Nere <clears throat> I'm quoting Chastel, actually. No one went so far in exploring the intuition that the attraction of beauty through the impulse of love that thrills through the entire being is the creative principle par excellence and the only one worthy of a noble soul. Important to mention Michelangelo because Oscar Wilde mentions him by name, along with Montaigne and Winkelmann. I can't go too long, so I'm going to skip Montaigne and talk about Win Winkelmann is the German art historian who essentially invented art history as an academic field for all the good that's done us. But he still wrote a great book, um, The History of the Art of Antiquity, in which he says the following about beauty. Beauty is one of the great mysteries of nature. We all see and feel its effect, but a general and clear concept of its essence remains among the undiscovered truths. Remains among the undiscovered truths. This is from Moliere. The love that binds us to the beauties of eternity doesn't stifle within us the love of worldly beauty. Our senses can easily be spellbound by the perfect handiwork that heaven has created. Its charms shine by reflection in women like you, but in you yourself, it displays its rarest wonders. In Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, Romeo falls in love with Juliet merely by looking at her, these are, his, these are some of his lines. Did my heart love till now, forswear it, sight, for I ne'er saw true beauty till this night. He enlists his visual acuity and the truth of his own eyes and ability to perceive her. Then later on, just before the balcony scene, when Romeo is hoping that it is not Juliet's maid who comes out onto the balcony, he says this, be not her maid, since she is envious. Her vestal livery is but sick and green, and none but fools do wear it. Cast it off. Her vestal livery, her moral livery. The, the word vestal is a reference to the vestal virgins. <laughs> Those are Shakespeare's words that only fools wear the false livery of chastity. Chastity as dull ornament. Is it not yet still superficial and shallow? Michelangelo. Winkelmann, Oscar Wilde, John Milton, Moliere, Shakespeare. All these people are be basically agree. Be beauty, is, it's, it's not, I don't, you wouldn't want to say it's a science, but it's a subject matter worthy of a noble soul, one of the great mysterious truths worth investigation, worth deep investigation. It is scorned and shunned, as Oscar Wilde says, by shallow people. Now, along these lines, I came across this poem that was written by Michelangelo. It was kind of a, a, a concessory uh, poem because he, he had declined to uh, paint the mistress of, uh, I guess, some, some rich guy. But here's the poem he wrote. He says, The new transcendent fair who seems to be, peerless in heaven, as in this world of woe, the common folk too blind her worth to know and worship, call her left arm wantonly was made full well, I know, for only thee. Nor could I carve or paint the glorious show of that fair face to life thou needs must go. Isn't that an incredible thing? Now, he agrees with Oscar Wilde, too. The common folk, the idiots, who are too blind to know the worth of beauty. The common folk are too blind. They're dumb and shallow. She, this beautiful woman was made for him and what does Michelangelo say perhaps you know a little cheekily that he could not do any better to life you needs must go not to the artist no artist can make her any better than she is physical beauty in person 
Michelangelo is saying is capable of superseding the, the beauteous power of art. It's quite a thing coming from Michelangelo, of all people. Now, there's another writer that we must compare Oscar Wilde to. And this one is quite, a, is quite an amazing comparison. But here's what Oscar Wilde says in one, in one place in the picture of Dorian Gray. The mutilation of the savage has its tragic survival in the self-denial that mars our lives. We are punished for our refusals. Every impulse that we strive to strangle broods in the mind and poisons us. The only way to get rid of a temptation is to yield to it, resist it, and your soul grows sick with the longing for the things it has forbidden to itself with desire for what its monstrous laws have made monstrous and unlawful. It has been said that the great events of the world take place in the brain. It is in the brain and the brain only that the great sins of the world take place also. Now, regarding that idea you heard about submitting yourself, submitting to your own impulses or else suffering for not, for not submitting to them. Here's another writer. This is not Oscar Wilde. Veritable wisdom consists not in repressing one's vices, for vices constituting, practically speaking, the sole happiness granted us in life. So to do would be to adopt the role as it were, of one's own executioner. The true and approved way is to surrender oneself to them, to practice them to the utmost. Now, regarding that other thing Wilde said about these monstrous laws that are made monstrous, consider this. Again, back to the same writer. This is not Oscar Wilde. But conventions, ah, conventions. May I be so bold as to ask you what they are? Now you will surely agree that these conventions ought to be based upon furtherance of individual happiness. If they do not ensure it, they are ridiculous. If they are harmful to it, they are atrocious. And an enlightened nation must set straightway to work rectifying these conventions. Do this, and lo, as though miraculously new perspectives, a new universe shall appear before you. A consuming and delicious conflagration will glide into your nerves. It will make boil the electrically charged liquor in which the life principle has its seat. That's the Marquis de Sade. And the Marquis de Sade is all over the picture of Dorian Gray. That tells you where Oscar Wilde's mind is. So, and if you don't know who the Marquis de Sade is, there is no close second to his depravity. He is where we get the word sadistic from. And it has to be said, if you make a list of everything you hold dear in an abstract sense, everything you consider to be virtuous, moral, and good, it follows that just about every single dead quotable poet would challenge each and every one of those things.